Hey everyone, this is the third in a series of videos I'm making about the biology and of course is exam in North Carolina. Now these videos are meant to help students review essential content in preparation for the biology EOC, but they can use as a reference for a lot of basic biology topics. If you follow along, I encourage you to use the resources linked in the video description and go ahead and subscribe if you like this kind of material. So this third video is going to focus on evolution and genetics, which is a huge part, almost half of the biology EOC in North Carolina. A lot of these topics are good to review by doing practice problems, so I encourage you to practice some of these after you're done with the video. We're going to cover essential, stand essential standards 3.1 through 3.5, as well as their objectives, which include topics like DNA, protein synthesis, mutations, meiosis, inheritance patterns, effects of environment on gene expression, biotechnology, genetic engineering, bioethics, evidence for evolution, natural selection, disease influence, classification systems, dichotomous keys, and cladograms. But keep in mind this video is meant as a review, so we won't have time to touch on everything, just the simplified essentials. We're starting with the structure and function of DNA. Remember, DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a nucleic acid, and it is made of nucleotides. A nucleotide is composed of a phosphate group, a sugar, and then of course a base, which in DNA is A, T, G, or C, adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Now the sequence of nucleotides in DNA codes for proteins, which is key to all of the operations that a cell will do. And most all cells of an organism have the same DNA, but that DNA that is expressed will differ. Um, so a muscle cell may express different parts of the DNA as opposed to a skin cell or a liver cell, but every single cell within an organism's uh, body is gonna contain the same genetic code. So, DNA's structure is a double helix, or a twisted ladder, and the sides are composed of this phosphate sugar backbone, that phosphate group and the sugar, and the rungs, or the middle parts of the ladder, are composed of our complementary bases, so adenine pairing with thymine, guanine pairing with cytosine, always. And these are joined together by hydrogen bonds. So this is our double helix here. This is the same structure, but it's just flipped on its side and untwisted. And you see A is paired with T's and G's pairs with C always. And then this is our base pairing rules. You might wanna remember this uh, in a weird way, like all teachers can go or apple tree, good cookie as long as you remember that A pairs with T and G pairs with C. So if you were asked to write the complementary sequence for a DNA strand, what you would do is just make sure you write the base pairing rules. So for this one, it starts with T-A-T, -T, you would wanna write A-T-A. -A. So here's the full strand. T pairs with A, A pairs with T, T pairs with A, G pairs with C, etc. until you make sure you've completed the entire sequence. Now replication occurs in a specific stage of the cell cycle and allows daughter cells to have an exact copy of DNA. So that's going to happen during S phase. Remember we went over the cell cycle in another video, so go back and watch that if you need more review. So the reason DNA replication has to occur before a cell can divide by mitosis is that we want to maintain the same number of chromosomes in the daughter cells as the parent cells. So I want you to think about that. If this cell were to split apart without dividing its DNA, we would only get half in each daughter cell. And if they were to split, they would only get half. And finally, we would just have minute amount of DNA and wouldn't be very uh, good for replicating cells. Now, DNA replication is what we call semi-conservative, meaning that the DNA is split apart and then a new strand is built off of the old template on each side and we end up with two new strands, one with an original strand and one with a brand new strand built off of new nucleotides. All right, and remember that DNA holds the instructions for proteins in a cell. So if we talk about how to make proteins, we need to go from our DNA transcript to mRNA and then the mRNA is going to help build the proteins. So cells respond to their environments by producing different types and amounts of proteins and all cells of the organism, like we said before, are going to have the same DNA and express different proteins um, depending on what they need. And protein synthesis is just the process by which DNA is translated and transcribed into proteins. So it's a fancy way of saying how proteins are made. And transcription is going to produce RNA from DNA, and then translation is going to produce proteins or an amino acid chain from the RNA. And these amino acids are linked by peptide bonds to form polypeptides. So we have a lot of different uses for proteins in the body, including hormones, enzymes, chemicals involved in special reactions, structural proteins, transport proteins, and all of these are going to get the jobs done for the organism and the cell and also give the individual the traits that they have. So the whole process of protein synthesis, again, goes from DNA to mRNA to protein. And remember, the step of transcription is DNA to RNA, and translation is RNA to protein. Um, sometimes you'll be asked to use a codon chart. That's part of the translation process. So make sure you Google practice questions with codon charts if you're not quite sure how to use them. 
Let's read a little bit on the differences between DNA and RNA. DNA, remember, is double-stranded. It has a deoxyribose sugar and it uses T or thymine. RNA is only single-stranded, uses ribose sugar, and uses U. So in RNA pairing, A is going to pair with U. Um, T does not exist in RNA. Another special thing about RNA is that it can leave the nucleus, whereas DNA always stays in the nucleus. So if we want to transcribe a sequence, now we're going to, instead of just matching the complementary base, we're going to think about what the RNA would be. So T still pairs with A, so we would put A first, but A, instead of pairing with T in RNA, is going to pair with U. So our complementary sequence would look like T pairing with A, A pairing with U, T pairing with A, and G's and C's are still the same. So you would write out the entire transcribed sequence. So if you're asked on the exam to transcribe something, make sure you're paying attention and including U's. If you're asked to just write the complementary sequence, you're just writing the DNA pairs. So pay attention for that. This is the entire process of protein synthesis depicted in one diagram. We start with DNA inside the nucleus. That DNA is transcribed, so a new mRNA template is built off of the DNA. That mRNA is going to leave the nucleus and then be translated at the ribosome by these tRNA molecules which are going to bring over amino acids and those amino acids will be linked up to form a protein. So I want to talk about mutations. Mutations can cause can be caused by mistakes in replication, transcription, translation, or other parts of the cell cycle. They can also be caused by mutagens, things that are going to change up the DNA order, um, things like x-rays, UV radiation, chemicals, etc. And some of the effects of mutations, they can have no effect at all, and we call those silent mutations. The changes could be good, they could introduce a new trait within an organism, or they could be really bad, or it could even cause a genetic disorder or death within the organism. So it really depends on how severe the effect is. A mutation that introduces a new base, for example, adds in a little C in the middle of a DNA chain, might have a huge effect on the protein because then everything in the reading frame gets shifted down. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to create the same protein that we wanted originally. So if you think about some questions that you might get related to, mu to mutations, you might be asked like what would likely cause an increase in the frequency of genetic mutations and something like exposure to x-rays would be a good answer for that. So understand that mutations are changes in DNA coding and they can be deletions, additions, substitutions, and they can be random or spontaneous and spontaneous and they can be caused by lots of different things. So again, if there's a mistake in the genetic code, then the mRNA is changed, and then the structure of the protein is no longer the same. Um, so an insertion, like we mentioned before, would be a big change. All right, so we're moving forward. Meiosis, I want to talk about briefly. It's really important in sexual reproduction. So this is how sex cells are formed. And remember, these are haploid cells. These are a little bit different than the cells formed from regular cell division in mitosis. Um, and meiosis is going to give us lots of genetic variation because of things like independent assortment, where the chromosomes line up and homologous chromosomes will line up in different ways randomly. And then crossing over will occur during prophase one, where the homologous chromosomes were exchanged genetic information. And then, of course, there's random fertilization between uh, whatever sex cell and then whatever sperm cell unite if it's a human um, or other organisms. So remember that in genetic variation, mutation is important, but these three reasons really from meiosis are some of the more important ones for all of the genetic variation that we have within a population. Remember, within mitosis and meiosis, both require DNA replication before they can occur. Meiosis has two cell divisions where uh, mitosis only has one, and meiosis produces gametes or sex cells, and meiosis is the only one that involves crossing over. Crossing over does not happen in mitosis. Um, and again, it's important to sexual reproduction because it provides genetic variation in the offspring, um, and so that's really something important you need to remember about meiosis. Some of the patterns of inheritance you might want to review are regular complete dominance, which is probably what you've seen in your practice problems with Mendelian genetics, co-dominance, where two traits are displayed in the organism, incomplete dominance, where we have a blend of traits, and there's also going to be some questions on sex-linked traits and multiple alleles. And a good example of multiple alleles that you've probably gone over is blood types. So make sure you know how to predict the inheritance patterns of each of these types of traits. Another thing to review is the influence of environment on genes. So for example, if identical twin girls are separated at birth and cared for by two different families in two different environments, after many years, 
these girls could have different heights and different weights. So the cause of these differences is that they probably had a different diet, different environmental exposures, and different physical activities. And the environment does play a role in influencing traits. So even if they are identical twins, they're not going to be exactly the same because their genes will be expressed in different ways. Some of the biotech and DNA technology you should review are things like gel electrophoresis, transgenic organisms, and the Human Genome Project. Gel electrophoresis is also known as a DNA fingerprint, and it's used for things like forensic analysis, parental testing, and looking at evolutionary relationships. We can use it to identify different individuals and identify and catalog endangered species. Transformation is possible because we have the same DNA in all of our organisms. And the only difference between the DNA of a dog, for example, and the DNA of a fly is the sequence of nucleotides. So we are able to manipulate different organisms' genetic code because the, tech, uh, because the DNA code is the same. Now, transgenic organisms are used in a lot of different areas, but agriculture is a big one, including manipulating certain organisms to resist insects, um, pharmaceutical applications, such as the production of insulin, and bacteria has even been modified to clean up oil spills. Now, what you need to know about the Human Genome Project is that this project was useful in determining uh, whether individuals carry genes for different genetic conditions, and it was used uh, a little bit towards developing gene therapy. Um, we wanted to map the genes in the human genome. Now, it was not as groundbreaking as we hoped it would be. There were a lot of things that we hoped to discover with the Human Genome Project. It was thought to be the cure-all for all diseases, but unfortunately it was not that, and there's still a lot of work to be done within the realm of DNA technology and the human genome. I want to take a quick look at gel electrophoresis in this review. Now, this is what a gel would look like, and you might be asked to uh, use a gel in your, uh, in your practice problems or in any of the test questions. Um, and with a gel, electric current is applied and the negatively charged DNA moves towards the positive end of the gel, which is at this side here. And what you can do is you can compare the patterns of the DNA bands and to see which ones match to determine, for this case, this is a crime scene, and you can look at the crime scene and which suspect best matches up with the particular evidence from the crime scene, and then you can identify your subject. Now we're talking about evidence for evolution. So we're shifting a little bit into our evolution topic. Um, there's a lot of different pieces of evidence that scientists use in order to determine evolutionary relationships and how organisms are related to each other, one of which is biochemical evidence, and this can be related to proteins and DNA. Um, we also have embryonic development that we can look at, fossil evidence, anatomical evidence, and these are things like morphology or different physical traits that organisms have. And so if you look at two different organisms, you might see that they go through similar developmental stages, and you can infer from that that they share a common ancestor. And if organisms, for example, have similarities in DNA sequences, um, we could assume that they share a recent common ancestor, and that's how we figure out their evolutionary relationship. Now you definitely, definitely want to review natural selection. Uh, organisms better adapted to their environment are more likely to reproduce and pass on traits to their offspring. And so the ones that are more successful are more fit to the environment. So species do have a potential to increase in number if the environment is uh, a good match for them, and there is variation in populations as well. But because there's a finite supply of resources, we only have, we have a struggle for existence, and changing environments are going to uh, provide selective pressure, selective pressure for specific phenotypes. And the organisms with the adaptations that are best fit for the environment survive, they reproduce, they pass on their alleles, and then over time, this contributes to a change in the population. So let's do a quick example with antibiotics. So here we have a population, and within this population, there is variation. Some of the bacteria in this population are naturally resistant to antibiotics, and some of them are not. Now, when the antibiotics are provided, what it's gonna happen is most of the individuals in the population will be killed, and only the ones that are, have the resistant gene will survive. Now, unfortunately for us, if we don't want antibiotic-resistant bacteria, that's gonna provide a good environment for the resistant bacteria to uh, pass on that resistant gene and to grow and to populate the particular environment. And so what we have now is an antibiotic-resistant population, and over time, the resistant bacteria, the ones that were more fit, have survived and reproduced at a greater rate than the non-resistant bacteria. And you can see similar examples with this with pesticides. Now you want to also review your classification systems as well. The earliest classification systems focused on physical traits and behavior to make uh, inferences about the relationships between organisms, but 
now we have better evidence that shows common genetic history um, between different organisms. So we can look at things like the DNA and we can make better uh, maps and better inferences about which organisms are related and how closely they are related to each other. You want to make sure you're able to use a dichotomous key, which is an example of which is shown here. And you want to be able to interpret what's called a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. And looking at these, you can determine how closely organisms are related um, and at which point they've branched off from other categories and groups. And uh, make sure you've done a few practice problems with these to review as well. All right. So that was a very quick review on our evolution and genetics that might show up on the biology EOC. Remember, this is a huge chunk of the exam, so make sure you go back and practice practice problems that are related to all the topics we've reviewed in this video. Thank you guys for watching.